Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Locked on Seminoles. I'm your host, Max. Today, we're taking listener questions, which means we're talking about things we have never talked about before, including the quarterback position, the linebacker positions, and if Norvell is, as the kids say, that dude. Hang around. We got a great show coming up for you, and I'm going to well, I'm going to give you the good and bad on Norvell, and I'm going to explain why I'm still a huge Jordan Travis fan. If you don't like him, just go ahead and, you know, listen anyway and get nice and infuriated on your morning drive. You are Locked On Seminoles, your daily podcast on the Florida State Seminoles, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Locked on Seminoles, your favorite daily Florida State sports podcast. Today's going to be listener questions, which means uh, it's pretty much going to be football. And it's brought to you by BetOnline.net. That's right. BetOnline.ag is now BetOnline.net. The game starts there. Go there to get all of your baseball action in, assuming we get an MLB season. I mean, look, we we're not, I don't know what's going on with that, but you've also got the NBA, you've got UFC, you've got NHL, all kinds of things that you can play during the week, but we're not here to talk about that. We are here to talk about the Florida State Seminoles. If you haven't subscribed to the YouTube channel, go ahead and hit the subscribe button. For the 730 of you that have, thank you. Genuinely, from the bottom of my heart, I did not think starting whatever this was, a year and a half, 18, whatever it was, 18 months ago, 20 months ago, that we would grow into what we've grown into. And now I can confidently say that I've been covering the team for, again, about 20 months. And I try to make you a little smarter as a Florida State fan. I'm Max at MaxMoody17 on Twitter. And I'm excited to be back in the saddle after a couple days away. Gentry Rogers comes in and says that he likes the Travis J pick. I assume us talking about him uh, uh, starting this year. And the center transfer as well. Wisconsin was the, uh, we had the center that transferred him from Wisconsin. Personally, I think Toa Philly will have a bust out year. I also think they move Gainer to edge and he comes back to life. As far as wide receiver, it's tough to say. JT, Jordan Travis, is a run first QB, so it limits all the wide receivers. Um, yeah, so I'll respond. We'll, we'll unpack that. Travis J., I still think is one of the most talented kids on your roster. I just, I don't know if you're going to see anything from him unless it's on the offensive side of the ball. I mean, he's just kind of, sorry, I'm playing around with mic positions today. I, we just haven't seen it. And I think that we've seen many a talented athlete come through Florida State, schools all over the country, really. And if they don't produce by a certain time, it's like an event horizon. It just, it doesn't happen. Could he turn it on in his third year? come out of nowhere and have a great year? Yeah, maybe, but pattern recognition tells us he's probably not going to do that, and it's it's just not the most likely scenario. I hope it works because, again, like I said on our show when we talked about starters, I think he's one of the most talented kids on your roster, pure and simple. I don't mean one of the most talented DBs, just athletically, he's amazing. He just hasn't been able to get it together, and I, I hope that that changes this year, but I'm not holding my breath for it. The center transfer, we'll see. I mean, here's the thing. It's a center from Wisconsin, right? Like that's, I think when you get a guy from Wisconsin, you should be excited because that is a program that whether they're good or bad is known for developing big, bruising offensive linemen that can run block. And we are a run first team right now to your comment about JT and inclusive of the running backs. And getting a guy from a school known for producing big, bruising, run-blocking linemen is an exciting prospect. Now, as far as Jordan Travis being a run-first quarterback, I don't disagree with you, but I don't agree with you. I think that early in his career, he was a run-only quarterback, and that was why he was put on the field. I think we've seen him develop into a passer, and I think, frankly— you're kind of putting the blame the wrong way there when you say that it's hard for the wide receivers to be good because of Jordan Travis. I would argue it's hard for Jordan Travis to be good because of the wide receivers. I don't think there's a quarterback in the country 
that if you could have magically waved a wand and put them on your roster last year, and I'm including Bryce Young, I'm including the guy from wherever out West that threw for like a million yards, 6,000 yards, whatever he threw for. I'm including McCall from Sam McCall from Coastal Carolina and Sam Hartman and um, Malik Cunningham and literally any quarterback that could have done much better with what you had at wide receiver last year. So do I think that Jordan Travis misses a read every now and then? Yeah. Do I think that that's a function though of him having to pretty much run for his life every play? Also, yeah. You can only do so much with receivers that consistently drop balls. I mean, how many drops two years ago now, but same receivers were in that Louisville game. I still go back to that play, third and 15, beautiful drop back in a pocket, lasers one to Keyshawn for a first down right off his hands. Parchment not fighting for balls. I mean, third and 14 was great, but he wasn't the guy to go out there and create space. Malik, I expect a lot from Malik McLean this year. But when we had to throw that fade route in the end zone against Notre Dame, down right by the 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 what used to be the band is now more seating, all came out when he hit the ground or on his way down, whatever it was, a, a better receiver. And I think he will become a better receiver. Keep in mind, he was a true freshman in his first collegiate game ever. But a better receiver at the time holds on to that ball. And maybe it's a different game against Notre Dame. A lot of times if you look at these plays, and I know it's hard on TV. I, I'm not going to pretend like I've got some special cable package, but you got to make an effort to go watch different plays and see what the receivers are doing. There aren't a lot of openings. And by the way, just because once Jordan Travis takes off and the cornerback decides to go after him, doesn't mean the guy was open in a way that you could have actually thrown it. Sometimes a guy not having someone around him doesn't even mean he's open when he looks open, right? Look at that interception against Notre Dame where you have a receiver come from the far hash pick him off or whatever happened. I mean, that was a receiver. I'm sorry, a safety, not a receiver. Sorry, y'all. It's been a long day of business consulting. Um, Yeah, look, I just, we can agree to disagree on it, I suppose, but the reality is that Jordan Travis had a 63% completion rate last year. He only had 195 attempts. If he had thrown the ball as many times as Bryce Young threw the ball, he would have been sixth in the country. In total passing yards, you add in his 600 rushing yards, he would have had 4,850 total yards as a quarterback. And we'd be talking about a potential Heisman contender going into this year. Now, he didn't throw the ball as many times as Bryce Young. He did get hurt. That's on him. But he also had to split reps with McKenzie Milton in multiple games because, frankly, you had a coach. And this is going to get in our next segment. We're going to talk about Norvell. I've got T. Hunt, Connor Kane, and Bacardi Select and Nick Stewart, and Chris from Perry, all lined up to talk about Norvell. But you had a coach that I frankly think had this image of who McKenzie Milton was in his mind and did not listen to what the other coaches were telling him or didn't use his eyes during practice. I don't know, but he wanted to force that narrative, right? He wanted to believe that that was going to happen. And I think it hindered Jordan Travis's development as did his injuries, which again, you can argue is a, is part of who Jordan Travis is. So you have to use that in your calculation of, is he a great quarterback? But your question was, is he a great quarterback? It was, he's a run first quarterback that limits all the wide receivers. And after all those words, my response, to that's very simple. I think he runs more than he should. I agree with that. I do. I, I think this year for him to progress as a passer, he needs to take that next step of, okay, Sometimes like, so, so I think this year we saw him hang in there on times where he would have run in the past. And I think there's a lot of times, frankly, where we saw him go like, you know, start to scramble, start to head towards the line and then throw it and got a lot more yards because of how much people had to respect his legs. So do you have to cancel some of that out if he stops running as much? I, I, I don't know, but I agree with you. I would like to see him pass a little more, but I would argue again against the limiting the wide receivers point he needs better wide receivers. Fortunately, we got three of them in the transfer portal. Y'all can watch our episodes about them. Uh, Or do we get four? We got Deuce Span, who has a lot of potential, but really no stats to, to, we don't know, right? But high potential. We got, um, yeah, we got four. We got our man from um, uh, Johnny Wilson from Arizona State, six foot seven, right? With crazy arm reach or crazy uh, uh, wingspan, right? We're going to see how that works out. 
We got Micah Parsons from Oregon, shipped like a fast kind of slot guy. And then we got um, the West Virginia transfer, who is a the most proven commodity we picked up in the transfer portal uh, with, I believe, 700 yard, almost 700 yards receiving to his name last year. So let's make a deal, Gentry. If after three or four games, Jordan is still running too frequently and he's missing open receivers and overthrowing guys, I will agree with you that he's holding back the receivers. But if with this new and improved cadre of receivers and another year for Malik McLean to develop and hopefully Josh Burrell back, he's lighting it up after three or four games. I don't know. I I guess I don't really get anything but the satisfaction of uh, knowing that mine was more correct. But hey, you may be right. So I want to move on. I want to talk about uh, the coaches. But before I do that, folks, I'm going to tell you about our friends over at BetOnline.com. Net. Formerly .ag, it is now betonline.net. Basketball season is in full steam. We've got March Madness coming up. And for all the latest odds, totals, player props, whatever you want to bet on, you can find it at betonline.net. It's the best spot for all your sports scores. And it's not just basketball. Betonline.net. Sorry, I had a hiccup there. Is your source for hockey, boxing, UFC, odds right now on Olympic coverage while well, that's still going on, and information based on that. So head to the website today, betonline.net, use your mobile device, and learn about the trends and learn about the action. Betonline.net, where the game starts. All right, so folks, as promised, we are going to talk about Coach Mike Norvell. And if he is, as the kids say, that dude, I've got, what, one, two, three, four, five of y'all lined up. We got two again. We got three against two, four. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to read y'all's questions or apologies. Quick water break. It's just me up here, folks. Got to stay hydrated or comments. And I'm going to respond in kind. I don't know if I'll fully agree, disagree, whatever, but I'm going to give you my thoughts on, on the Norvell situation. And I actually had a good combo about it today. So the juices are flowing about how I feel about Mike Norvell. So T Hunt, we'll start off with you. I don't think Norvell can recruit at a high level. I don't have any confidence in him and this coaching staff. Connor Kane, 12, builds on that. Says Norvell's not a good coach. Y'all have been fooled by the recruiting, which fell apart at the end. We barely won every game. We should have lost to Miami. Pure luck. I do not know how any of you can think we're going in the right direction. Norvell will be gone after next season. Picardi Select is a little more animated. Little Norvell, there is an explicit in there, ain't it. In over his head, will never be a 10-win or CFP coach. He let Miami and Florida gain a higher-ranked class when both programs had coaching turnover. And there's probably more negative comments that I just didn't pull. So we're going to start in negative town, because why not? You know, I, I, I am not ready to throw in the towel as a Florida State fan and say that Norvell is not it. But I think all of you make valid points. Connor Kane. Recruiting did fall apart at the end. I mean, look, we lost Travis Hunter. Okay. We kept Sam McCall. We lost Mortimer, the receiver that went to Louisville, who that's a whole different issue now. But nonetheless, still lost him. You didn't sign a single prep receiver, which was a position of need. You lost a legacy, major legacy recruit at a position of need and linebacker to the SEC. Which is which happened, I mean, I guess the last one we lost to Maryland and Brandon Jennings, but it still has already happened. Like we've seen this, right? A lot of murmuring is going on about is this because of NIL? Is it because of not? It you know, Jimbo Fisher claims that NIL has nothing to do with Texas AM. <laughs> that was pretty comical, but um Texas AM's recruiting, I mean, okay. But I too share this concern about Norvell recruiting at a high level. And I understand, and we'll even see it in these next comments, that we need to give him time. I I get that. But did Jimbo Fisher have time? Because because Jimbo Fisher came in as an offensive coordinator slash head coach in waiting, which I believe is no longer a title. And by 09, he was signing great classes. That was his first, was first year as head coach. He signs a great class. Like after he'd been named after Bobby had left, he signs a great class. Right? And then he goes on in what, 2010? to sign an even better class. Was it 2011, I think? He signed like the number one or number two class in the nation. 
he was cooking with gas. Now I get it. We hadn't really been as bad under the last Bowden years as we were under the last Jimbo and the Willie years and the beginning Norvell years. But like, I, I guess just how long is that an excuse? Because comparatively, we kind of were that bad under Bowden at the end, right? Number, nominally, the number of wins was greater under Bowden in his last two years than the last year of Fisher and the first year of Willie. I, I understand that. And you could say Jimbo is here as offensive coordinator. I, I get that too, but I don't know if that really, with the, in the transfer portal, portal era, really passes the smell test. Like, yeah, he got to build up relationships and do all that, but he also wasn't head coach with his own group of guys recruiting for him that he got to deploy all over the place. So his resources as offensive coordinator were still limited. He didn't have NIL. Didn't, again, didn't have the transfer portal to bring people in. He had to do it the old-fashioned way. And he started producing pretty immediately. Now, is that fair to compare Norvell to Jimbo? Maybe not, but also maybe, right? Like, now Jimbo Fisher is a national champion. Jimbo Fisher is now one of what? Five or so active head coaches in the, in the FBS to have won a national championship. But that's not who he was in 09. In 09, he was an offensive coordinator and won a championship as a coordinator under Nick Saban. And he was an offensive coordinator under Bobby Bowden, who's becoming a head coach for the first time. Is that that much different than being a head coach at Memphis and going whatever, 13-0? and 0? I, I don't know. And what worries me is not so much this year. Because I'll admit we improved a lot this year. And we took steps forward. What worries me is looking at the year beyond that. I look at 2023 and I wonder, okay, if we want to win 10 games next year and someone, I, let me see if I can find it quickly. I'll, I'll give you credit for it because I actually thought it was a pretty good, uh, uh, it was well worded. Um, gosh, I'm, oh, here we go. RJ. Thank you, RJ. Um, you know, said basically, look, Wake Forest is winning 10 games with scrubs based on recruiting rankings. So even with a top 25 class, why aren't we winning 10 games? And it's like, he's not wrong. That's not an incorrect thing to say. We, we keep saying we need to get our guys in, but you don't need a top 10 class to win eight games in the ACC. You shouldn't. You sure as hell shouldn't need a top 10 class to win six to go to go bowling. Right. I don't know. So. I guess I'm not responding to specific things in those questions, but I'm saying there there are some cracks there and it is a little a little worrisome, right? Because again, you don't need an amazing class to go top to to win eight games in the ACC. So let's say he wins eight games next year. Well, who's coming in 2022 that's going to have an immediate impact that or let's say spring of 23, whatever. Spring of 23, the 2023 class, who's going to have this immediate impact that we're going to jump from eight games to 10 games the next year? Because if it's all based on him not having the guys right now, well, when are we get? When's the cavalry coming? I guess is what I'm asking. Because you're about to lose most of your good D line players after next year. You're going to lose a lot of talent in the defensive backfield probably in the next I don't know a year, one to two years. You got Sam McCall. That's a great pick pickup. But who's who's going to replace all these folks that you're losing? Because I'm looking down the chart and it's like you start to see these 23 kids, 24 kids. It's not that far away. And he's not making big splashes on the trail with them yet. And that's concerning because, in my opinion, you can win the ACC with top 15-ish classes. It's, it's possible. It's the ACC. But you're not going to compete for anything of national relevance until you have top five classes. You just aren't. Maybe you can be Cincinnati. Great year by Cincinnati. You can go to the playoff, and then once you're there, you can lose by 25 points, 20 points, whatever they lost by. Not saying they didn't belong, but that's what they did. That's not what Florida State's happy with. So until we start getting those top five classes, that's that is our that is our ceiling of ceilings of ceilings. And I just wonder when's that ceiling gonna get elevated? When are those top five kids coming? Because it was supposed to be this year, and uh, our number one recruit ran off to ran off to Jackson State. Almost at Georgia. He shunned Georgia too. 
And uh, Mortimer, our best receiving recruit, bounced. Um, who, who was the other guy that we had? We had like that high four-star receiver that was going to stay with Miami and then ended up flipping to Jackson State as well, which was kind of funny. But nonetheless, it, it, you didn't clean up in positions of need. And then we look at the 23 class, and it's like, do you have linebackers coming into that class? Are you filling out your D-line in that class? Are those going to be – are you filling them out with instant impact guys? No. Because there's only a handful of guys at the D-line and the linebacker position that can have an impact their freshman year, and none of them are committed to Florida State right now. So there's a lot of work to be done if, if Norvell is going to be, quote, the guy. That being said – Today's Tuesday as you're listening to this, Monday as I'm recording this, and I feel like I didn't get to get to the good, but I've also taken up like 25 minutes of y'all's time. Not taken up, y'all like being here, and I like having you here. But I think this is something where I kind of want to table this a little, and I want to start tomorrow as you're listening, right? So Wednesday as you're listening, with the good, and let there be a little like, this can be my negative episode, that can be my positive episode. I don't know. I'll be in the same shirt, though, because I'm going to record it in like 10 minutes. So, folks, thanks for stopping by. Tomorrow, we are going to talk about the good in Mike Norvell. And we're also going to do some looking ahead to who I think could be a breakout player in 2022 that we haven't really talked about so much. So, again, thanks for stopping by. Make sure you subscribe. Make sure you like the video. Make sure you hit the bell and turn on notifications. I'm your host, Max, and this was Locked on Seminoles.